me, because you used to sit over there. I, I need these spatial cues if I'm going to learn your guys' names, so don't start moving around on me, guys. <laughs> yes? How, uh, how closely should we pay attention to like, the methodology and statistics in the readings, like that section? Yeah, so I don't have any expectations. We're certainly not going to be evaluated on that. You know, I try to give you basic understanding of some of the quantitative stuff in the class. Um, you know, I try to give you an, a, kind of an intuitive feel for what an odds ratio is or what a regression model does or what age adjustment does. You've seen some equations. Today you'll see a couple more. Actually, today is the day you're going to see some equations. But you're never going to be asked to produce those equations. You might be asked to describe in prose what the topic, you know, what the meaning of the concept is. Uh, now, of course, if you can produce the equation, that's fine too, but it's not expected. So, so the methodology, you know, you don't, you should read the sections of those papers, but, you know, I don't expect everyone in this class. It's an introductory level social science class. Did I answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Other questions? You never ask me questions at the beginning. I don't know why I want to stop asking that then. Uh, Okay, but I like it that you ask questions during the, during the, during the talk and, and periodically when I say so. Okay, so last time we discussed different ways of conceiving of causes of death and we paid particular attention to um, you know, health behaviors and a specific focus on, on smoking and guns and alcohol last time. And we continue to look at the impact of different kinds of interventions uh, as we're transitioning topics in a number of ways as the semester proceeds. So we're beginning now to look at some policy interventions. Well, what, what might we do about some of uh, these causes or these uh, determinants of mortality and longevity in our society? What might be some reasonable interventions? And we began to look at things like taxation, laws, and counter-marketing uh, the last time. Now today I'm going to be transitioning to a slightly different way of thinking about things a little bit because I'm going to make some remarks about what is known as income inequality. And income inequality is an intrinsically collective measure of socioeconomic status. So as contrasted with strictly individual measures that we've been discussing. So up to now, we've been talking about you know, what is your race? What is your education? What is your income? What is your uh, height? What are attributes that you have as an individual? But now we're going to be talking about something that's measured at the collective level. And while you can speak of the wealth of populations, just like I can speak about your wealth, I can speak about your wealth, and I can speak about the wealth of this group, <clears throat> inequality is something that's only defined at the population level. I cannot speak about your individual income inequality. It's a group level property that we're going to be talking about today. And I want to provide a sort of pivot for the conversation we will be having about the importance of social support, social networks, and social capital to individual health. So by setting the stage today, we're going to begin to talk about other supra-individual phenomena, factors that adhere in groups that affect our collective well-being. And I want to examine how yet another social structural factor influences uh, the health of individuals. Now this here is a pretty standard way to chart variation in wealth around the world. So many of you have seen images like that. This shows per capita GDP in 2011 for different countries. So the United States is exceptionally rich. Uh, you know, Northern, you know, sort of Western Europe is quite rich. Africa is quite poor. And you get a smattering, you know, countries around the world where the bigger intensity uh, indicates our richer countries. And you've all presumably seen maps like this, which countries are rich, which, which ones are poor, on average. And not surprisingly, the wealthier the country is, the healthier it is. And so this slide shows GDP per person based on purchasing power parity, so this normalizes the purchasing power. And on the y-axis is the average life expectancy in years. And you can see roughly a monotonically increasing function, uh, like the fitted line of monotonically increasing. So, uh, you know, the richer and richer you are, the healthier and healthier you are. But it's not a linear relationship. It's a curvilinear relationship. So every additional increase in wealth up at the top gives you smaller and smaller improvements of life uh, expectancy. Again here, at the country level. So there's lower marginal, but still increasing return to per capita income at higher income. Okay? This is a country level measure. Every dot represents a country. You plot them and you say, as countries get richer, do they get healthier as measured by uh, longevity? But each additional increment in wealth doesn't give you a linear increase in health. It begins to plateau uh, at some point. Now, there's another way to look at wealth, however, and this is one that privileges not how wealthy each country is per capita, but rather how the wealth in that country is distributed within each country. 
And it turns out that both the absolute level of wealth affects your health, how rich the country is affects your health, and, or is associated with your health, with the country, the health of the individual in that country, and also how the income distribution within that country, uh, how, what, how, that, how distributed the income is, that also is associated with how uh, healthy the country is. And this happens at various levels of geography, as we're going to see today. So, well, how might one measure the inequality in the distribution of wealth? So here, this slide shows, uh, so this slide shows something known as the Gini coefficient, and countries with more um, equal distributions of wealth, where the wealth is more equally distributed, are shown in green, and unsurprisingly, intuitively, these might be the Scandinavian countries, and countries where wealth is less equally distributed are in darker and darker shades of red. So in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, especially down low, there's very uneven distribution of wealth. And the United States is somewhere in the middle in terms of distribution of wealth. Let's say roughly similar to Australia, but a wider distribution, more inequality in the United States compared to certain other countries. OK, so if I asked you, how could you distribute wealth in a way that was completely unequal? What would be a completely unequal distribution of wealth? For instance, the wealth in this room. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, if one person had all, you had all the wealth, and the rest of us had none, that would be very unequal. Uh, the rest of us wouldn't like that uh, at all. That would be the most unequal distribution of wealth you could imagine. It sometimes confuses people a little bit, and maybe it'll become a little bit clearer. Like, the rest of us all have equally zero wealth, so why aren't we quite happy with that state of affairs? But actually, each of us is very different than you, who has all the wealth. So that type of distribution would be considered the most unequal distribution. Conversely and trivially, what would be the most equal distribution of wealth of everyone in this room? Yes, you again? Yeah? Yeah, if everyone had the same exact amount, that would be the most equal distribution of wealth. Yeah? So we could define it in any number of ways. And for now, I'm just being very abstract. So it doesn't matter how you define it. So whatever the goods are, whether they include other you know, redistribution, net of taxes, not including taxes, fixed assets, or we're talking about income. So we could ignore everyone's wealth and just say, well, you know, we're going to apportion amount of income in the coming year. So for now, we'll be very abstract on this. So we're just saying, you know, what would be the most equal way to distribute a pot? And so we give each of you uh, the same amount. And I also want to be clear that what we're talking about now is, is uh, we're talking about outcome, and we're not talking about opportunity or dessert, right? So we're not talking about like, whether you deserve this distribution, nor are we talking about whether everyone has the same opportunity but earns different amounts. We're just simply talking about the outcome, like what's the most equal distribution uh, or not. And here's how one measure of inequality uh, can be quantified. This is the most classic version. It's called the Gigi coefficient. Uh, and this is the coefficient that goes from 0 to 1. And in this coefficient, uh, the number zero corresponds with perfect equality, where everyone has the same income, or wealth, or assignment of the resource, or whatever that resource might be. And one corresponds to perfect inequality, where one person has all the income, or wealth, or resource, and everyone else has zero income. And algebraically, it's half the arithmetic average of the sum of the absolute differences between all pairs of income in the population normalized to the mean income. What, and here's the equation for that. What does that mean? So here's xi and xj, and then it's, it's summed across j and summed across i, <coughs> and I'll intuition, divided by 2 times the number squared uh, uh, normalized to the mean income. So what does that mean? It says, OK, I'd like to quantify how many people the income in this room is. I'm going to take my income, and I'm going to take your income, and I'm going to subtract those two and compute the absolute difference in our income. And I'm going to take my income and your income, and I'm going to subtract those two and compute the absolute difference, and mine and yours, and mine and yours, and mine and yours, and I'll do that for me and every other one of you, and compute the absolute difference in our income. Is everyone with me so far? And then I could divide that by the sample size, divide by n, and that would be the average difference between me and everyone else. Is everyone with me still? The average absolute difference between my income and every one of your income. And then I could normalize that by dividing that by the average income. That would give the normalized average difference in income between me and everyone else. Is everyone with me so far? Then, yeah, Rosario. Can we just pick anyone at random? Yeah, you pick anyone at random for the first person. Okay. So the next step is you pick the next person at random. So having done me, then you move on to you. You compute the difference between you and everyone else and do the same calculation. 
and then you and everyone else will do the same calculation. And now you sum across that uh, variation. You sum across all of those pairs of individuals and divide that by n again. So it's the sum of all the differences of each person to each every other person in the index. So you say, well, how different is my income than everyone else's? How different is your income than everyone else's? And the average of all those different averages is the Gini coefficient. It's a way of summarizing how heterogeneously is the income distributed in the population. Do you at least have an intuitive appreciation for this? If everyone had the same income, the difference between me and every one of you would be zero, and the difference between you and everyone else would be zero, so there'd be no difference in income between us and anyone else. And so the Gini perfect equality would be zero, okay? And if I had all the income and every one of you had zero, the difference between me and every one of you would, all, would be the maximum difference possible between all of you. And between all of the rest of you would always be zero, because zero minus zero is, is zero. And so I would have all this throw weight of my income difference from everyone else. Does everyone understand where I am so far? Just intuitively? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that also reflects in part this normalization by the average income. So it's just measuring how unequally, whatever the income is, we could all be sharing a billion dollars or we could all be sharing a dollar, just how unequally is it distributed? Other questions? OK. And this is typically used to measure income inequality, but it can be used to measure distribution on any axis, such as inequality in education, or inequality in height, or age, or anything else. So you can say, well, how, how unequal is the age in this room? How is it distributed? Or how unequal is the education in this room? And so forth and so on. And another way to describe the income distribution is to use something known as a Lorentz curve. Now here's how the Lorentz curve works. So the Lorentz curve here on the y-axis is the proportion of total income. And on the x-axis is the decile of, let's say, households or individuals. Okay? And so what this says is, is if you go to the first 10% of the household, do they have 10% of the income? And if you go to the first 20% of the households, do they have 20% of the income? And if you go to the next 30% of the households, do they have 30% of the income? So if, if you move across the decile of households, they have a progressive increase in the decile of income. It means that this is a line of equality. The income is perfectly distributed. Conversely, if the first 10%, next 10%, next 30%, and so on, if they have no income, it's 0%. You have to go all the way to get to the last household, and then bang, that guy has all the income, right? So as you move through the population, you sweep through the lowest decile, the next lowest, the next lowest, no money, no money, no money, no money, and you get to the last guy, and he has all the money, right? So you get to the last guy, and he has 100% of the income, that would be considered the most unequal distribution. And of course, usually it's somewhere in between, and that's known as the Lawrence curve. That curve that says, for example, here, the bottom 20% of the households have 5% of the income. Of course, when you get to 100% of the households, by definition, 100% of the income must be there, and 0% of the households, 0% of the income. But this slide says that 50%, the bottom 50% of the households have like 18% of the income. Do you see the curve that's being defined so far? And it turns out that the Gini index is actually given by looking at two, two areas here. So the Gini index defined in the previous slide is A, this space between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve over A plus B. So the ratio of the area between the line of perfect equality and the Lorentz curve is A, and the area underneath the Lorentz curve is B, and A over A plus B also defines uh, the Gini uh, coefficient. Now there are other measures of inequality. This is just one that I've introduced today, which you may or may not like. It's just one way of characterizing the, the distribution of income in a population. Uh, but other measures of inequality, for example, include something known as the Robin Hood Index. And the Robin Hood Index approximates the share of total income that has to be transferred from households above the mean to those below <coughs> the mean to achieve inequality, to achieve equality in distribution of income. So this, the Robin Hood Index says, well, how much money do we have to take the richest half of the population to give to the poorest half to equalize the distribution of income? across this uh, population. And it actually corresponds to something you don't need to know, but that's it's equivalent to the maximum vertical distance between the Lorentz curve and the line of uh, equal income. So if you find where is the maximum vertical, vertical distance here, that gives something known as the Robin Hood Index. And there are other kinds of ways that you can quantify inequality. For example, the proportion of total income 
earned by the bottom 50% or 60% or whatever of households earn. So you'll see all of these in the newspapers. You'll see, well, you know, I think it's, this is truly astonishing. I think the 80 richest people on the planet, the 80 richest people on the planet have as much wealth as the bottom 4 billion people on the planet. Right? That's a very unequal distribution of income globally or wealth globally. So 80 individuals have as much money as 4 billion people uh, on the planet. Um, and uh, uh, so that, you know, or you could say like the bottom, the, the top 5% of American households own, I'm making this up, half of the wealth in the country or something like that. Or the bottom 50% have 10% of the wealth. Or however it is you want to describe it, you can use these types of percentages to describe income distribution as well. Is that, is that clear so far? Now income inequality in the United States, as measured by the Gini, has varied across time. So here is the, on the x-axis is time. Uh, here's the Gini coefficient measured. Uh, so here in the 1930s, just before the uh, Second World War, uh, you have the peak inequality. It's been rising steadily since 1970, a big inflection during uh, this, the Reagan and Bush administrations. Uh, it's been planning a little, but it's still going up. Actually, if you brought it to the present day, uh, by some measures, it's the income inequality in our country today is higher than it's been in 100 years, higher even than during the Gilded Age or during the time of the robber barons that many of you read in high school, those cartoons of you know, fat cats and money bags, I don't know if you remember, those, but Monopoly cartoons, uh, those cartoons. So the income inequality in our society today is more unequally distributed, uh, roughly speaking, than at any time uh, in the last uh, 100 years. And in fact, even among wealthy countries, there is variation in how the wealth is distributed. So you can now look across, not just across time in the United States, but you can look across countries, for example. And the wealthy are not the same everywhere. These are some findings of a survey of population's ideal ratio. So people were surveyed in different countries and asked about what their ideal ratio between CEO and unskilled worker remuneration were. So they were asked to say, well, what do you think, what should be the difference in pay between a CEO and an unskilled worker? Should the CEO earn 10 times as much money, two times as much money, 100 times as much money? How much more money should a CEO earn than a typical unskilled worker at their firm? And they asked respondents in each country what they thought was the ideal thing. Uh, and then they asked them to estimate, OK, well, that's what you think is ideal. What do you think is actually happening in your country? So if you look here, these are different countries here in the United States. The red shows the estimated ratio between uh, worker pay and, uh, and, uh, and CO pay and worker pay. So they think it's uh, the ratio is something like, what is that number there? It's something like, they think, Americans think that the average CEO earns about three times as much as the, uh, as the average uh, uh, you know, uh, unskilled worker. If that's right, that ratio figure there, you can't see, maybe it's 30 times as much. 30, I can't see that, sorry, 3 seems too low. Even for, even for the man on the street, they wouldn't think 3 is, is typical or reasonable. <coughs> so the average American thinks that the typical CEO uh, uh, earns about 30 times as much as the worker, and they think that the reasonable ratio is probably closer to 10 or 12 or whatever that number is, okay? So we asked the average American, how much do you think that the typical worker should earn uh, uh, more than the typical CEO, they say about 10 or 12 times. How much do you think he or she does earn more than the typical worker? They say, I think it's about 30 times, okay? And of course, those two proportions vary from country to country. Here in South Korea, for example, they think that the, you know, the number is 40 and uh, whatever it is, uh, 12 or 15, for example. But, it, yeah. The width is just capturing countries. I don't think there's any mean to the width. It's just a, a circular rendition. So these are two different countries here, France, Here's Germany, it's down low, and then so each, each point is tipping to one country. You could have little tiny lines instead of filling in the stuff. You could also actually, I, I thought it would be nicer to organize this by the, the length of the red line, so that you would actually have a, like a spiral figure, but, but we didn't want to remake the figure. Maybe I could torture my TFs and <laughs> to have that But anyway, uh, that's it. But that's not the, even the main point. So this slide says two things. First. Uh, there's a difference between people's ideal and their estimates of a given country. And second, in any country, and the, and the estimated is always bigger than the ideal, right? The red is always bigger than the blue. But second, that it varies from country to country. So far with me? Okay, now let's look at what the, yeah? Is that, are, you, are you asking a question? Yeah, you're just waving? Oh, no. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, my most embarrassing thing ever was when someone was picking their nose, which you weren't doing, uh, when I called on them. Uh, anyway, so uh, <laughs> everyone look cool. uh, Anyway, so um, so this is. But now let's look at what the real uh, dis uh, 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 income inequality, the ratios are in the country. So this little green, yellow, red, I'm sorry, red and blue thing actually falls at the middle of uh, the actual ratio of inequality uh, within the countries. So here, if you look at the United States, the average American CEO earns 352 times what the average unskilled worker earns. So remember, the average American thought that the, unskilled, the CEO should earn 10 or 12 times more. They estimated that the CEO earned 30 times more. Actually, the CEO earns more than 350 times more than the typical uh, workers. So that little red and blue thing shrinks down into the middle. And this too varies, obviously, from country to country, although the variation is different. For example, here in Austria, there's a smaller gap between actual earnings and you know, either estimated or idealized uh, earnings. And here's a closer look at the ratio of CEO pay to average wages. The, U the United States has a ratio in this slide of 500 to 1 increasing all other countries, take it from the world, uh, world of work report. This is our wealthy, the same everywhere. Ratio of average CO pay to average wages. You can just look at 211. Uh, it's about 500 times the average CO pay to average wages. Much bigger than the UK, Germany, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Netherlands. Other countries we think of as rich and quite civilized don't have quite this much, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, inequality is captured by this metric. In the last few decades, in fact, most real income growth in the United States has gone to the wealthiest. So it's true that we become richer on average. We are a wealthier nation than we were 20, 50 years ago, no doubt about it. But not everyone, not all boats are being raised, forget the same amount, raised at all, actually. Most of the income growth uh, in the last uh, few decades has gone to the top richest uh, portion of our population. So if you look at the 10 percentile of people at the bottom, they basically had no material income growth to speak of. Yes, they've gone from, this is a real household income at selected percentiles, and this is uh, normalized to $213. So there's been some income growth at the bottom. The average American household hasn't gained much since 1967, going from 43,000 to 51,000. So that is a gain, no doubt about it. But it's a tiny gain over 45 years, a period of time in which the United States has become one of, continues to you know, rise in terms of the wealth of our nation. And the biggest change has been in the 95th percentile, where there's been very substantial, both relatively speaking and absolute growth. So I won't say double, but it's gone from 115 to 196,000, maybe doubling of the real wealth of the people at the top 5%, and adding an extra, I don't know, whatever it is, $80,000, whereas here there's been an increase of maybe 10% at the median, and an adding of only, let's say, $4,000 in real dollars to people at the median. Is that clear? So I hope this is beginning to shed light on, in, when you read in the newspapers when people are talking about this topic, some basic statistics describing what, are, what is the big conversation that's happening in, our, happening in our country about income inequality. And one of the conversations is, it's saying, well, rising inequality is a price we have to pay for getting richer. So we say, who cares if the people at the top are getting more if everyone is getting wealthier? Why do you care if, if she's getting an extra 100,000 if you're getting an extra 10,000 would be the argument. And that's a good question and a fair one. I'm not taking a stand on it so far. But uh, it's not necessarily the case that you're getting 10,000. You might be getting 10 and she's getting 100,000, or nothing and she's getting 100,000. So now you might actually care if the society is, quote, getting richer. You're not seeing any of that wealth, first point. Second point, even if the society is getting richer, if the inequality is rising, there might be other adverse consequences. It's not just like <clears throat> you should not only be paying attention to the amount of wealth that's accruing to a group you should be paying attention to what's known as the second moment of the distribution. Not just the average, but the dispersion in the distribution. How is that wealth allocated? Because just like rising wealth can be associated with rising health, as we saw in the first or second slide, rising inequality, the distribution of wealth, can also have the consequences for the health of individuals and the health of populations. So we might be saying, well, we are getting richer, but we're getting more unequal. And actually, that inequality, even if the wealth were helping us, which we don't know if it is, even if it were, that has to be weighed against whatever cost there might be from the fact that the income is more unequally distributed. And for me, I have actually relatively few political beliefs about this topic. I'm actually very instrumental. I'm really just interested in what gives us the most civilized society, what's actually best for our society. 
what would be a way to so organize ourselves so as to create the best civilization, the most enlightened, the most beautiful, the most productive of knowledge, the healthiest, which is my main concern. How can we ad adopt policies of different kinds with respect to this topic today that make us better off, at least when it comes to health? And in fact, inequalities varies not just across time in the United States, but also across space. This graph shows the relation between Gini and mortality adjusted for age in each state in 1990. And the, uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the circles have a diameter proportional to the population. So for example, this shows the Gini of income per equivalent adults. So this is the Gini coefficient here. And this is the law of odds of mortality. So more likely to die is up here, and more unequal is here. And here are Mississippi and Louisiana uh, right over here. And on the bottom are New Hampshire and, uh, and Utah. Uh, down here, which have the lowest inequality and rough and the lower uh, mortality, for example. Okay, so across states, there seems to be a relationship between how unequally the income is distributed and how healthy the states are. Now, one of the questions that immediately is raised by an analysis such as this, and you read several papers on this topic uh, in your readings, is the question of whether everyone in unequal areas is being harmed or just those at the bottom. So actually, if you live in a more unequal way, if, if you're the poorest person in this classroom, or if income is une unequally distributed in this classroom, it could be equally distributed or unequally distributed, are only the people at the bottom harmed by such a distribution? Or does everyone somehow get harmed, maybe just a little, by <coughs> this unequal uh, distribution? And the general answer is that unequal income and hierarchy may be not just bad for those at the bottom. There may actually be adverse consequences even for those at the top. And this is a very contested hypothesis, and it appears to be extremely sensitive to the level of geography, as we're going to uh, show you today and as the reading discuss. Because, for example, right off the bat, you should have an appreciation for the fact that Louisiana and Mississippi not only have more unequal incomes compared to Utah and New Hampshire, but also they're poorer than Utah and New Hampshire, right? So at a minimum, we're going to want to account for the relative wealth of those two. Before you run out and say inequality is bad for your health, which is what I'm going to try to say today, we have to at a minimum account for actually absolute levels of wealth as well, both at the collective level, at the state level, at the area level, and at the individual level. Is everyone with me still? Yeah, OK. So maybe Mississippi and Louisiana are doing terribly here because they're just poor. So we need to account for that as well. So patterning across time, patterning across space, and income inequality in our society. Now, you could then go down to a smaller level. You say, well, maybe the states are two big uh, areas. And the same analysis could be repeated at the metropolitan level, looking at thousands <coughs> or hundreds of MSAs uh, around the country. And you find the same pattern. I haven't marked the cities here. But you find the same pattern using at the metropolitan statistical area, the MSA uh, level uh, here. This was worked by uh, Dean Lubatsky uh, in SSM, two economists. So, what do we mean by a possible effect of an area that you reside in? So if we're going to say that there's something about the inequality of the income in the area around you that affects you in some way, for example, makes your mortality worse, what does it mean when we say that? If you live in Mississippi or Louisiana, we want to say something about living in those states. They're poor states, and also the income is unequally distributed. Both of those things are bad for you. Well, one possibility um, is that uh, area context matters. And the idea here is that this is the difference that places make to people. There's something toxic about that environment. It sucks to be in an area, in an unequally, in an area where some resource is distributed unequally, and that's harming you, is the claim. Okay? But a second possibility is that area composition matters. And here it's that the, this is the difference that people make to places rather than the reverse. For example, suppose that neighborhood A has twice the mortality rate of neighborhood B. But what if everyone in neighborhood A was very old? For example, neighborhood A was a nursing home over there. Neighborhood B is Yale College students. It's not a shocking result. We're not going to say that nursing home is killing people, right? Or something like if you went to that nursing home, you would drop dead. That's not what we're going to say. We're going to say, actually, there are different people in that nursing home than there are here. That's the compositional effect. That's the difference that people make to places. And you have to take that into account before you can conclude something about the contextual effect or the difference that places uh, make to people. Now the claim with respect to income inequality is that income inequality is an intrinsically contextual effect. And that, and that um, 
and that, and that this arises even though people who live in more unequal areas might also be different than people who live in more equal areas. For example, they might also be poorer. Okay? So we have to first take into account that fraction of the difference that has to do with a compositional effect before we can make a statement about what fraction of the difference has to do with the contextual effect of places upon individuals. Everyone with me still? And so now the question arises, in fact, does living in more unequal circumstances affect the health of individuals? And initial work in this area was purely ecological, like some of the data I've shown you so far. Looked at different areas and looked at the mortality outcomes in those areas and didn't go down to the individual level. Just said areas of more inequality are areas with higher mortality and that left it at that. Didn't measure individual level uh, mortality based on area exposure. But more recent studies that have used superior designs involving both individual and contextual measures nested within one another have provided more robust insight into this hypothesis. These are some results from a particularly well-conducted study taken from your reading assessing how state-level inequality, net of individual-level income and other factors, can harm individuals. And this study looked at people residing in the continental United States. It looked at over half a million people, ages 18 to 74, who lived in the contiguous United States between 1987 and 1984. And on average, these people were followed for five years and there were nearly 20,000 deaths, 19,379 deaths in this population. And they had individual level family income in 27 categories, which were adjusted for inflation and family size. And they had state level Gini categories, which were categorized into five levels. So in the year and the state that you were in, how unequal was the income? And they also knew about the individuals, their age, race, sex, marital status. They controlled for how poor the states were, in addition how unequal the income was, and the median income uh, of the uh, population. State level poverty, median income, and so forth. And what they found uh, was, uh, was the following. This shows income inequality and individual mortality risk in this paper which was in your reading. So they start, let's say, with family income. And they find if you're poor, you have more than twice the odds or the risk of death compared to if you were in the richest category. So the odds ratio of death in during follow-up was 2.69. So you had uh, 2.69 times the odds of dying during follow-up if you were in the poorest category compared to if you personally were in the richest category. And there was a gradation, which you've seen before, we've talked a few lectures ago, that the richer you are, the less likely you are to be at elevated risk of death. Now, after accounting for that, they also looked at, well, what's the effect of living in a more unequal state? And they found that if you live in a more unequal state, you have a 12% increased odds of death during follow-up. And there also there was a monotonic gradation until you lived in a relatively more equal death. It's a relative risk of total mortality. So they found that there was a big effect of individual income, not surprising, but also there was a smaller effect, but still visible and graded, of state level inequality after controlling for your individual income. So despite whether you were rich or poor, living in a um, more unequal state harmed you even after taking into account your individual uh, wealth. And just to benchmark you a little bit on these income inequalities, less than 0.34, so the more unequal, uh, the more equal states here the, over here, that's like Scandinavia or Japan, uh, and over on this end is like Morocco or Australia. So if you want to just get a benchmark across <coughs> the United States, what those differences are like. So it's like roughly the difference of like your mortality risk. If I took you from Japan and moved you to Morocco and said, okay, well, this is the income distribution around you, and you may have some intuitive understanding of those income differences, that's the impact that this gradation would have. And the finding also, this, uh, this uh, paper also looked at income inequality and individual mortality now in this graphical way. So what we're going to do here is, is we're going to look at the individuals and what income category they are. Are they poor, near poor, middle income, or high income? And we're going to look at deaths per 100,000 person years, what fraction of people die in any given year of all the people followed for that year, for example. And then we're going to look at the state level income inequality in categories, from low to low moderate to moderate to high inequality. Okay? So for example, amongst poor individuals, it didn't matter whether there was income inequality around you. You're poor. Whether you live in Louisiana or in New York State, it sucks. Okay? 
And among rich individuals, it didn't matter. You're rich. The income inequality around you in this study had no different effect. But in the middle income categories, there was a roughly positive gradation so that above and beyond controlling for your own income amongst people in the middle, the more unequal the income was in the state in which you lived, the worse off you were, the more likely your health was to be harmed, here as measured uh, by uh, the death rate. So income inequality may not be so relevant for the very poor or the very rich, uh, albeit for different uh, reasons. Well, what might be some of those reasons? Why might it not affect the very rich, for example? Why might it not matter to a rich person whether they live in a, an area with unequal or equal income distribution? Yeah, what was your name again? What? Joel. Yeah, so one theory we'll get to later today, or, or maybe tomorrow, I can't remember, is that being at the top is good and it doesn't matter, you know, what else, what's happening below you, who cares? Uh, uh, that's one idea, yeah. So there's a kind of psychodynamic, psychic, uh, let's say, way that be, that, that's, that, that explains that. Yeah, other ideas? Any other thoughts as to how the rich might be unaffected by income inequality? Yeah, what's your name? Angela, huh? little micro enclaves, and this is a little bit that insight, Angela, is what we talked about at the beginning of the, like, how geographic area might measure, might, might affect this thing. So if you made the area smaller, this effect might disappear than the income inequality. So within each area that we got really down low, you'd have only rich people in this area, so we would no longer see this effect. Yeah, Gianna. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So what she's pointing out is another, yet another explanation. And here the idea is that actually rich, you can just buy whatever you need anyway. Who cares what you know is happening around you? You can afford to insulate yourself from whatever it is that's going on. You can have a private police force, for example, or privately educate your children, or, or fly privately, or, or whatever you're doing, you can afford to just buy it uh, yourself. So it doesn't matter uh, what's happening around you. That's right. And similar arguments apply at the other end of the spectrum. If you're poor, it just, you know, it's terrible to be poor, no matter what is going on around you. Might be the reason in this one study why you have this pattern. Here's some results from a different investigation. These show that within every level of individual income, every single level, living within a United uh, a state with more inequality is associated with worse health, here measured as maternal depression. Now this, unlike the previous, this shows a different outcome, different study, different database. And now we're looking, however, at a similar kind of metric. But we find that actually you have this, this uh, rising, uh, uh, monotonically rising relationship within each individual income quintile according to the Gini coefficient. So for example, if you get more unequal income, if you're the poorest or the richest, it's, you live in a state that are at greater risk for maternal uh, depression. So here the outcome is the percent who depressed uh, depressive symptoms uh, uh, in the postpartum uh, period. So here it is seen throughout the distribution. But as I noted earlier, the results about the effects of income inequality are actually mixed. These are data from still another investigation. Here of nearly 10,000 people nested within metropolitan areas. So this, this study is looking at, uh, at cities, at 60 cities in the United States. And the investigators obtained self-reports of various common chronic medical conditions and examined how local income inequality at the city level, net of individual income and other traits, was associated with these health conditions. And they found little, if any, effect in this study when measured at the city level. So they looked at, well, what's the probability that you're going to have arthritis, hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, or rate your health as poor, or being in pain, or any of these other, or being depressed, for example. And here they looked at the levels of inequality, and the curves are basically flat. There's not some kind of a apparent relationship that the more unequal you are at the city, the more unequal the income is distributed in the city in which you reside, that the worse off uh, you were. So a heterogeneous mix of studies, different outcomes, different uh, levels of geographic aggregation, give a complicated picture about what's happening empirically about whether or not income inequality actually harms you. Plus, it may matter on where you are in the distribution of income, too, if you're rich or poor in the middle. So it's not really obvious, okay? 
mix of, uh, of studies uh, in the situation. Nevertheless, Subramanian and Kawachi, in your reading, suggest that this is still an open question, but there are some generalizations that are possible based on the huge literature that has accrued on this topic in the last 20 years. They say that, first of all, there are more findings about the impact of inequality in the United States than elsewhere. And there are more findings at state levels than at other levels, which actually gives hints into a possible mechanism of these effects having to do with state level political uh, policies. And in the Condo reading, Condo at all reading for today, provides a meta-analysis of the effects of local inequality and documents the likely impact. So Condo at all, so Kawachi and Subramanian try to summarize and throws all the studies and come to some conclusions. Condo at all in the reading for today is a meta-analysis, also looking at subgroups, men more than women, are they affected? Are different age groups affected? And basically it comes to the conclusion that across all of these studies, there does seem to be an effect of income inequality on health outcomes. And, I, and if, I, if you ask me, do you think there is an effect, I would say yes. But I would say it's, you know, the, the, the science is still confusing, a little confusing on this topic. Any questions? <coughs> well, now how might social inequality affect uh, individuals? Well, there are a variety of possible ways uh, that it might happen. Uh, there are three classes of explanations that link inequality to individual health. And one class of explanations, it's what's known as the neo-material environmental uh, explanation. And these might include things like differential social spending, neglect of the common environment or the commons, underinvestment in human capital, or lower social capital, all of which are ideas that we're going to be discussing. And they are neo-material in that they reflect the modern, neo-modern environment that we humans have made and construct. So something about the modern world in which we construct them for ourselves, that modern world in circumstances of inequality can come back uh, and harm us. For example, more egalitarian societies may make more investments in the common good. There might be, if you go to Scandinavia, for example, or have a more egalitarian society, there might be more investments in infrastructure that are used in common, like trauma centers. Maybe if you're a rich person and everyone else is poor, you don't think to build a trauma center. Or maybe it's too expensive even for you. But now all of a sudden you need a trauma center and you, like everyone else, suffers. So a trauma center might be something we all contribute to in common. And if we're all in the same boat, we may be more likely to build trauma centers, for example. Or techniques for reducing pollution might be another idea, right? You say, okay, well, we all need to make investments. You know, we need an EPA and we need an infrastructure and a bureaucracy to keep the air and the water clean. And we can do that because we're a more equal society. And that's why there's less air pollution in more equal societies and more air pollution in unequal societies, for example. Or there might be other investments in public goods, such as food safety or public education or library books or even maternal health that benefits everyone, the rich and the poor alike. And a more egalitarian society might have less crime and so fewer rich people might be shot in a, more, uh, in a more egalitarian society. And there can even be the idea of this development of social capital, a kind of desirable property of groups, which we'll come back to in a few lectures. Or as Lynch et al. argue, income inequality might be associated with educational and medical expenditures per capita. And these types of things might in turn have cumulative effects that harm people over their lifespan or benefit them over their lifespan. So that's the first set of arguments about how inequality might map the neo-material environment explanation, how it might be the, the mechanism by which inequality <coughs> might contribute to ill health. So more unequal societies make uh, fewer investments in air pollution reduction, maternal health care, uh, trauma centers, etc. And then because of those lower investments, everyone suffers, including well, especially the poor, but also even other rich. Neo-material environment. The second set of arguments focuses on psychosocial environmental processes, of which in turn there might be two types. First, income inequality might have physiologic effects. There might be direct physiologic effects of being in a more unequal place. This might be the stress hypothesis, right? So if you're in greater, if you're in a place of more inequality, you might be stressed by the fact. Uh, by the fact. And second, there could be direct psychological effects or this notion of relative deprivation. So here the idea is, is that it's not that you have physiologic response to inequality, 
but rather some kind of psychological response to inequality uh, based on looking around you and seeing what is happening. And in fact, inequality can work by such so psychosocial means. And we're going to consider this at length uh, the next time, but there might be psychosocial processes that may damage health, such as a sense of relative deprivation or an erosion of social bonds, and latent social conflict or hostility, or resentment that harms everyone. In other words, income inequality might produce adverse effects inside people's bodies and not just outside people's bodies, as in the neomaterial explanation. Okay? So the neomaterial explanation is, what does the inequality do outside your body that harms you? The psychosocial environment explanation is, what does the inequality do inside your body that harms you? And it can do two kinds of things inside your body, physiologic things and sort of psychological uh, things. Moreover, um, and these mechanisms might reinforce each other, of course, and they may operate at different levels of geographic aggregation, larger and smaller respectively. So the neomaterial explanations might work at the state level, but the psychosocial explanations might work at the neighborhood level, right? Because you care about the relative, your relative wealth compared to the people you see you know, in Sabre College. Right? You look around you and you see who's there, and now that's how you, you measure it. You're not aware of the wealth in Greenwich or the poverty in Bridgeport or other inequality elsewhere. You just look around you. Okay? That might be the relative, uh, that might, be, might work at the local level. But the new material level might actually have to do with what are the laws that are being passed in the state of Connecticut? Or in New Haven, what is the taxation regime that is being imposed by the municipality? And so the new material thing might affect you more broadly. Those are the level at which, for example, it might make uh, a difference. Moreover, income inequality over smaller areas might have either more or less of an effect than income inequality over larger area, since less investments occur, uh, less since investments occur at the state level, or more since we assess ourselves over a smaller range. So now we have a kind of sense in which the scale, the geographic scale at which we're looking at the problem, gives us insights into the um, the uh, the, uh, uh, the mechanism, the, kind of the way in which inequality might actually uh, be affecting us. And finally, the third way is a technical explanation. It's called the individual income explanation, which I'll come back to shortly. So let's consider the first explanation first today, uh, and then we'll, con uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll consider the first one in a moment. We'll consider the neo Darwinian one in a moment, and we'll come back to the individual explanation also in a moment. But let's start with some, uh, some of the uh, psychosocial explanations first. So you know that feeling you get when you, uh, when you walk onto a plane and you enter from the front and you walk past first class? Who's had that feeling? How do you feel? Come on, it's not a hard question. Do you find it enjoyable to walk past first class and go to steerage? No, it sucks, right? I mean, you know. You go by and you see the pillows and, uh, and the stewards and stewardesses are saying, can I help you, sir? You know, and meanwhile, you trudge to the back and there's no luggage space left and there's no space and, uh, and so forth. It's annoying and it makes you feel envious. But it passes, right? Eventually, you walk past first class, you get to the economy, you get your seat, maybe you forget what happened in the front of the plane. And so the question is, is this psychosocial aspect the feature that harms you during your flight? Is that why you feel less rested and more stressed when you arrive, uh, when you arrive, then the more fortunate first-class passengers. Is it that psychosocial mechanism that's harming you, or instead, is it the material conditions that are the difference between first-class and economy class? They have more room, get more sleep, have less noise, fresher air, and better food. Right? Maybe that's why, when the plane arrives, the people in first class fare better than the people in economy. It's not that you're aware of the fact that they have. It's not a psychosocial impact. It's a new material <coughs> impact. And this distinction is very important because it's relevant to public policy. Under the psychosocial interpretation, these health inequalities would be reduced by abolishing first class, right? If, that's, if it's a psychosocial problem, then we just abolish first class. That will fix it. Or we could offer therapy to the people in economy class, for example. You know, that might be the, the solution to the problem, okay? But if it's the neomaterial intervention, removing the amenities for first class doesn't help the people at the back. Right? Abolishing first class doesn't help the people at the back. If it's the neo material explanation, we need different public policies. We need to raise up economy class so that its amenities approximate first class amenities. Do you see the difference then? 
how these difference in mechanisms have implications for how we might uh, approach the problem. Now, of course, both sorts of effects could obtain, uh, and they might have different magnitudes. It's not an either or. Actually, both are true. But in different circumstances, they might have different relative uh, impact. You can actually use the Gini measure to quantify inequality in seat space and plot how it's changed across time. So at the top, here's the typical cabin configuration of a plane from when I was your age. Okay? Uh, there might have been you know, six or eight first class seats, and everyone else was in uniform economy. And if you look at the space allocation, the inequality in space allocation in flights back then, the Gini coefficient was like 0.08. Okay? So actually, it was pretty equal, uh, the inequality in that uh, situation. So in those old planes, 7% of the passengers used about 15% of the room, and the other 93% used 85% of the cabin space, and they had a Gini index. Such a plane had a Gini of 0.08. And for reference, the United States Gini right now is about 0.48. But since then, things have become a lot more unequal. In today's standards, shown in the middle plane, the domestic configuration, 12% of the people in first class have about 25% of the passenger space. <coughs> 51 people in economy plus have another 30%. And that leaves the sardines, another 157 people, with 47% of the space. Uh, that gives a Gini index of about 0.16. And actually, transatlantic flights are even worse so the first class people have 21% 20, of the 21% of the people uh, use 40% of the plane and so forth. Uh, I won't go through all the percentages, but that you have a Gini of 0.25 if you look at a typical uh, transatlantic uh, jetliner. Now, by the way, this gives you a nice way to appreciate how unequal our society has become, insofar as we have more unequal allocation of space on planes. But just to be very clear, I don't want you to confuse the point here. I'm using this point to illustrate inequality in space assignment and to sort of say, well, how do people in these planes uh, fit in? It's actually rather more difficult to use this anecdote to make claims about our society because, for example, the people have paid for the space in these flights. So on a per dollar per square foot basis, actually the business class travelers are paying more than the economy travelers, okay? First point. Second point. Actually, with the deregulation of our society, the people that we might feel sorry for, the sardines that are sitting in the back, prior to the availability of such low-cost seats, those individuals would have to take the bus to get from New York to Florida. Now they can fly in four hours sitting as a sardine and pay 200 bucks, but before they might have had to take 24 hours for the equivalent $200 and so forth. So maybe, there are better, maybe they're better off too. So the point of this analogy is just to show you that inequality how to visualize inequality in a plane, not to make so much of a broader policy point, narrowly with respect to planes. But I do want to highlight this, right? There are new material and psychosocial implications of this difference <coughs> differentiation. Now, unless you think that the idea of abolishing first class is a crazy idea, take a look at this event from a year or so ago uh, that took place in Sweden. Lunch lady slammed for food that is too good. A talented head cook at a school in central Sweden has been told to stop baking fresh bread and to cut back on her wide-ranging veggie buffets because it was unfair that students at other schools didn't have access to the unusually tasting offerings. So here's this charismatic cook at one Swedish school that's making do with the same budget and cooking better. And all the other schools say, that, that's terrible. Make her stop, right? <laughs> Not because we are psychologically, psychologically being damaged by the awareness that this other nice school exists rather than let's up our game and make better food, for example, in our schools. Um, and here, just to read the uh, article a bit more, it said Annika Erickson, a lunch lady at a school in Falun, was told that her cooking was too good. Pupils at the school had become accustomed to feasting on newly baked bread and an assortment of 15 vegetables at lunchtime, but now the good times are over, the story said. <laughs> the municipality has ordered Erickson to bring it down a notch since other schools do not receive the same caliber of food, and that is, quote, unfair. From now on, the school's vegetable buffet will be halved in size, and Erickson's homemade loaves will be replaced with store-bought bread. Her traditional Easter and Christmas smorgasbords may also be under threat. Parents and pupils alike find the municipality's orders distasteful. Fourth graders at the school have even launched a petition in protest against the decision to put a lid on Erickson's passion for cooking. Um, and in this case, actually, I think the decision was eventually reversed. Now, unless you think that this only applies to Swedish lunch ladies, here's an argument closer to home that may be harder for you to digest. Here's something that was recently in this country here, having to do with the allocation of slots 
at competitive New York schools, coping with difference should we bring the top, uh, top down. And so there was a big argument recently about the elite schools in New York City uh, about whether to make the schools fairer, the city should punish poor Asian students <coughs> who are outperforming all other groups in this community. And the story reads as follows. In 2004, seven-year-old Ting Shi arrived in New York from China, speaking almost no English. For two years, he shared a bedroom in a Chinatown apartment with his grandparents, a cook and a factory worker, and a young cousin, while his parents put in 12-hour days in a small laundromat that they had purchased on the Upper East Side. Ting mastered English and eventually set his sights on going to Stuyvesant High School, the crown jewel of New York City's eight specialized high schools. When he was in sixth grade, he took the subway downtown from his parents' small apartment to the bustling high school to pick up prep books for its eighth grade entrance exam. He prepared for the test over the next two years, working through the prep books and taking classes at one of the city's free tutoring programs. His acceptance into Stuyvesant prompted a day of celebration at the laundromat and immigrant families' dreams beginning to come true. Ting, now a 17-year-old senior starting at NYU in the fall, says of his parents who never went to college, they came here for the next generation. And these storied specialized high schools in New York have for more than 70 years admitted students based upon a competitive examination of math, verbal, and logical reasoning skills. But now, troubled by the decline in uh, Hispanic and black enrollments at the schools, opponents of the exam have resurfaced and for example, Mayor Bill de Blasio has argued that relying solely on the test creates a rich get richer dynamic that benefits the wealthy who can afford expensive test prep. But as Ting's story illustrates in <coughs> this newspaper that goes on to elaborate, actually it's not affluent whites, but rather the city's burgeoning population of Asian American immigrants, a group that actually still remains disproportionately poor and working class, whose children have previously aced the exam in overwhelming numbers and actually a more holistic and subjective admissions criteria would be more likely to benefit children of the city's professional elite even than African American and Latino applicants while actually penalizing middle class Asian American kids. So this is exactly, this, not exactly, it's a very similar problem to the Swedish lunch lady problem. Should our focus be on raising up everyone or should our focus be on lopping off the top uh, instead? And these are the difference between the new material and the psychosocial explanation. And finally for today, we'll return to both of those explanations in class next time, but I just wanted to introduce the three ideas today. I want to get to the last technical reason for the relationship between inequality uh, and well-being and health. Let's consider the so-called individual income explanation, which is the third one. So if you wanted to draw a relationship between SES and health, you could easily, so is that clear what I've said so far? Is that clear? If you want to draw a relationship between SES and health, you can easily imagine a number of shapes. So one idea is that there's some kind of a step function. So here you have some measure of socioeconomic status, for example, income, and here is health. And the idea is, is that your health is low until all of a sudden you reach some threshold value, and then bang, your health improves dramatically, and then once you have that much wealth, there's no further gain to be gotten. You just have a continuous level of health after that. Another possibility is a linear relationship between the two, so that for every step up in socioeconomic status, you have a proportionate step up in health. So for every two, the extra $10,000, you get some increment uh, in health. But of course, as you can imagine, in reality, the shape is more like this. There are declining marginal returns to socioeconomic status. So the first $10,000 gets you a big boost, and the next $10,000 another big boost, but eventually the boost begins to flatten out. So eventually, if you have a million dollars, or 10 million, or 100 million dollars, an extra $10,000 or even an extra million dollars doesn't do as much for your health at that part of the distribution. So there's a declining marginal return uh, uh, to income uh, upon uh, health. But it's still monotonically increasing, okay? It's still always better to have more money in general probably, but certainly with respect to health. Now, a very fundamental reason that the health of a population, a very deep and fundamental but sort of artifactual reason, that the health of a population depends, on, uh, depends not only on the average income of the population, but also on the inequality of income in a population is as follows. And the intuition is very straightforward. So here's the intuition. If there is a curvilinear relationship at the individual level, which there is, if you take away uh, uh, um, $80 from this individual here, 
So you take, you tax this individual, you tax them, I'm sorry, X dollars from individual A, you remove X dollars from them, so you lower their income from here to here, and you transfer the X dollars to this individual, so you move their income from there to there, you lose this tiny amount of health, alpha health, from this individual, but you gain this large amount of health, beta health, in this individual. Now the total amount of income in the society is the same. And the total number of people is the same. So moving income around from person to person cannot change the average income. The average income remains the same when I take money from you and give it to you. But if the relationship is curvilinear, taking the money away from a richer person and giving it to a poorer person adds more health to the poorer person than it removes from the richer person. So this means that average health can rise when we move income around, even though average wealth doesn't change. Because of this curvilinear relationship, reallocating resources can improve health even if the average income stays the same, if the distribution of the income is, uh, is changed. So that's totally different than what would happen if it was a linear relationship. If it was a linear relationship, taking X dollars from this person would remove an alpha level of health from this person, and giving it X dollars to this person would just add beta level. And here, beta equals A because the slope is flat in this curve. So redistributing income in a situation in which there's a linear relationship between the two doesn't improve anybody's health. I'm sorry, it does improve some people's health, but it doesn't improve population level health. Is everyone with me so far? And it turns out the fact that the relationship between health and wealth is curvilinear at a very deep level explains part of the reason why we, at the community <coughs> level, have a relationship between income inequality uh, and health. That is, if all that matters to health at the individual level is absolute income, and if the health income relationship is nonlinear, average health in the society will improve as average income increases, and average health will also improve as inequality decreases. As you tax the rich and give to the poor, you're going to decrease, uh, you're going to increase average health for the reasons I just gave, if there is this curvilinear relationship. A community with more equal income <coughs> will tend to have better average health than a community with more inequality for the same total income. And this is called the absolute income hypothesis for explaining the inequality health relationship. And it's a mechanism having to do with the individual level relationship between health and wealth. And also note that this is a, these are the statics, however. A dynamic change might have different results as a rich person might change his behavior if you took $100 away from him. And I'll come back to this point later on. These are just the statics, not the dynamics. That is to say, if we assume that this line is not moving, if we assume that, we, we assume that this line is stationary when we're implementing our tax regime and transferring wealth, but if actually this line shifted around when we started taxing people, then you'd have a different situation. But for now, that's all I need you to understand. And no doubt, in fact, the concavity in the relationship between, uh, between income and, uh, and health explains at least part of the population level association between inequality and health. That is, this individual level relationship could explain some of the societal level relationship. But the association between income inequality and mortality actually does go beyond that explained by this statistical <coughs> artifact of an individual level relationship between income inequality or uh, between income and mortality. This graph shows results from an analysis based on 1990 data for the, United, uh, for the 50 United States. And it shows two separate sets of 50 points that are co-plotted. Each point in these scatter plots represents one of the 50 states, with the area in each circle proportional to that state's population. And on the x-axis is the mortality uh, here, so this is higher mortality, and here's the median share of the total state income. And so what it shows is there's two sets of points, 50 points in red, 50 states, and 50 states uh, in blue. The red line shows the downward sloping relationship between inequality and health <coughs> outcomes that would arise solely as a result of the concavity. So that little tiny negative slope that you see across the states is the slope that you would get if all that was happening was the curvilinear relationship at the individual level. But the real data is actually in the blue line, which is a much steeper slope. So part of the slope is explained by this little uh, absolute income hypothesis, but not all of the slope. It turns out that the association between income inequality and mortality is considerably stronger than that which can be accounted for by the concavity at the individual level. And in fact, something else is going on, as we're going to see. 
Any questions? All right. Oh, yes. One question. Oh, no. You explain the blue and the red? The blue and the red again? Okay. So what we're saying is there's this relationship between income inequality and mortality. So here's mortality over here, and here's inequality. And more inequality is higher mortality, and less inequality has lower mortality. Okay? So this is low, and this is high. And what we say is, well, what would be the relationship between those two, state-level inequality and state-level mortality, if the only thing happening was this concavity relationship at the individual level? That $10,000 to you, if you're very rich, is worth less than $10,000 to him if he's very poor. If that's all that was happening in the world, and no neo-material, and no psychosocial effects, no other effect, just the mere fact that it's not a line, a, a, a linear line between um, the two, you would get this slightly downward sloping red set of points. That's what you would get. But that's not what we see. We see an even bigger relationship between income inequality and mortality, as shown by the real data in the blue line. And the point is, is that therefore this absolute income hypothesis only can explain some small part of the income inequality and health relationship. The rest is explained by the neo-material and the psychosocial explanations, which we've introduced today, and which we'll discuss again more tomorrow and actually the session after that. Any other questions? See you next time. <clears throat>